Hello, friends. Just wanted to talk to you guys about something in the game that, at times, I think is elusive to a lot of players. And this thing called delving, and deep delving for that matter. Some people probably have some experience with delving itself. Um, but they haven't really gone to, you know, the depths that a lot of players uh, who frequently obtain fossils get to. Uh, a lot of people, they push for, you know, 6,000 depth and beyond. So that player base is actually quite small, though. There's probably, I don't know, anywhere from 200 to 500 players, I would say, uh, out of the entire POE population that actually get to that depth. So um, I kind of wanted to make this presentation so I could clarify some things and talk about, you know, uh, how, do, how do the deep delvers do things. So let's get started. So what's delving and why do it? Uh, delving, uh, basically what happens is uh, we find Nico uh, in areas. Um, there will be three Nico uh, sulfite veins uh, in, in each area that he's located in. And depending on, um, you know, things such as uh, the tier of the map and quad quantity on the map, and uh, if you use sulfite scarabs or if you use sacrifice fragments or different fragments for that matter, that can adjust how much sulfite you're getting, um, as well as the uh, the watchstones too. If you get uh, platinum uh, lex proxima watchstones, uh, you can roll a chance for for double sulfite, which is pretty cool. I'll talk about that a little bit more later. But uh, in delving, what we do is we require a little bit of sulfite. Uh, sulfite is what enables our cart to move. Um, it, it costs sulfite for the cart to move from node to node. Uh, and we do delving because uh, delving allows us to get a lot of things that, uh, in almost all cases, you just can't get them anywhere else in the game. Now, there's a few exceptions. Like, uh, for example, once I had a fractured fossil drop uh, in an altered distant memory map, uh, one of those synthesized unique maps. Um, it had uh, rare monsters have a chance to drop fossils, and a fractured fossil dropped in there, which is pretty cool, but that's extremely rare. This is a lot more re reliable way to you know go about getting the fractured fossils. Um, so we, we do the delving so we can get fossils primarily. Um, there's other reasons to delve, but that's, that's probably the biggest one. Now, let's continue. So let's talk a little bit, a little bit about fossils. Uh, fossils, they give us a method to craft. Um, when they came out, uh, they were even stronger than they are now. They got nerfed a little bit, but they're still in pretty good place. Um, you know, with the, with the current situation with harvests, uh, it, it essentially being gutted for the most part. I know a lot of people aren't too happy about it, but I think we're going to see... Uh, the resurgence in fossil crafting. It's going to come back quite a bit stronger. Um, I'm wondering if my suspicion is that uh, fossils will, the price of fossils will increase a little bit next league uh, with respect to this current league and previous leagues. So what they do is they, they allow us to, um, they give us some semblance of deterministic crafting. And um, I, I provide an example here on the right might be a little difficult to read, but I'll provide a link for the PowerPoint below too as well. But um, let's say we're trying to make a physical weapon. What we can do is we can use Jagged Fossil, which will roll a physical modifier, but no chaos modifiers, which is good. We want physical modifiers for physical weapons, right? So we're going to use Jagged Fossil for sure. The thing we don't want, though, uh, of course, unless we're doing like a bleed build or something, we don't want anything that gives us uh, like damage over time effects. We're just looking for um, flat physical, percent increased physical, and then hybrid physical with attack rating um, on a non-influenced weapon. We're looking for those three. So we can use the Jagged Fossil. It can land those mods, but it can also give us like bleed mods and things. So to prevent bleed mods from occurring, um, we can use uh, a different combination of fossils. Like, 
we, we can use a corroded fossil to prevent uh, elemental modifiers from rolling. And we can use um, we can use like a shuddering fossil uh, to give us uh, you know a higher probability of having an attack speed roll. Um, and then we can also use prismatic as well. Uh, all the fossils uh, they give us different attributes and things that we can do to craft. And I'll show that in the next couple slides here. Uh, but real quick, here's just like a, a screenshot from Poe Ninja. Uh, this is just talking about like the fracture fossil prices and the all the fossil prices for that matter. And the thing is, this fluctuates, uh, you know, daily essentially. So what I would do is I'd recommend if you're looking to buy or sell fossils, um, take a look at Ninja Poe Ninja, and look at the fossils uh, with your correct league, of course. Some people play standard. Go look on standard for that. If you're on Ritual, look on Ritual for that or ultimatum when that drops. But you, you can see what the prices are doing. One thing I like about Ninja 2 is they put a nice little graph um, to give you like a trend of what the fossil price has done over, I think it's it's probably like a couple of weeks, I'd have to guess. I'm not 100% sure, maybe 30 day period. You get to see like how the price fluctuates. So Ninja's pretty cool for that. So this is just like the price of some of the fossils here. And there's some more fossils, of course. And this slide, uh, and the next several after this, I effectively just went to uh, the POE wiki and took screenshots of fossils. Uh, we can look at what they do here. This is just a list so you guys can take a look and say, okay, I'm looking to craft XYZ item and I need this combination of fossils to do it. So this list, next couple slides, and this one included, will give you uh, what the effect of the fossil does. So I'll just go through these real quick. Nice and slow, so you guys get a chance to read them. But the biggest fossil, of course, is the fracture fossil. The fracture fossil itself is the one that um, it's generally the most expensive, um, with the exception of like the bloodstain fossil and legion the at that time the blood fossil bloodstain fossil was about 10 exalts a piece kind of absurd right now it's it's sitting right around 60 chaos but it's also the bloodstain fossil is quite popular because if you if you run fractured maps um the bloodstain fossil uh allows for a 10% additional chance for items to drop corrupted so if you combine that with the Watchstone Sextant of unique monsters drop corrupted items, uh, the amount of six links that uh, drop in the map is dramatically increased. So let's keep going here. Um, I didn't really decide to talk too much about uniques here. Um, a lot of the uniques in Delve are like complete trash. Um, some of them are pretty strong early league. And then uh, things like the all amulets, um, they can be quite good, especially if you get like a pride roll or a malevolence roll. Those can be decent. So don't totally discount those. But other than that, most of the uniques aren't any good. And then I, I elected not to discuss uh, Precursor's Emblem Rings. Uh, that's quite a gamble, but if you hit the right ring, you can be looking at multiple mirrors. So um, I'm sure other YouTubers have, have made videos about you know, things like uh, gambling those rings and trying to get something amazing. But like I said, the ones that are amazing, multiple mirrors. So that's it's something to consider, but I elected not to discuss it too much. So the build we're talking about today is the Ice Shot Miner. What's cool about this build is we can be located at, at, around a corner entirely and throw mines out away from us so that they start shooting around that corner. And that's like a huge component to build. You're going you're gonna to do your best to not be in the direct line of sight uh, of monsters when you get to nodes. 
So the way that works is you'll run to the node, you'll run the card into the node so the node can start, or you hit whatever you need to hit to activate the node. And then you're going to run to your hiding spot, drop a flare, and then just start pooping out mines. Uh, your mines are going to be doing all your damage. Um, things like auras are pretty important. Uh, I'll talk about it a little bit later, but uh, you got like divergent uh, summon skitter bots and divergent bone chill. Those two things are extremely strong, and uh, they actually eclipse the amount of damage you get from using something like a circle of fear, the hatred ring with hatred aura. You'll get more damage uh, if you elect to do divergent bone chill, divergent summon skitter bots. So that's that's pretty cool, and. Uh, another great thing about the Ice Shot Miner is we're not actually doing our attacks. So the mines are, are doing the attacks themselves. So we can get uh, modifiers, uh, for example. I'll also talk about this a little bit later. But on our boots, our, one of the popular boot enchants is 10% uh, increased elemental penetration against enemies if you have not killed recently. And since we never kill and our mines do all the killing, that mod's always active for us. So we can take advantage of mods that are similar to that and mods that are that, of course. And we'll see that later in the video uh, as I continue to talk about uh, the items on this build. Um, another variant, instead of a dead eye, you'll often see is you'll see this as a scion. Um, one of the, the benefits of the scion is um, they have access to uh, Berserker passes from the Berserker Ascendancy, and the big one is 15% more damage. So you, you can actually do more damage on the Scion variant of this build. Um, but there's some quality of life things that are nice with Dead Eye, like um, a lot of people considered it a nerf. I think it was a buff. Um, previously, the amount of chains uh, gave us more damage, but now our projectiles have a chance to chain off of terrain, which is incredible because in Delve, everything is essentially closed by walls. So you can have a mine that fires arrows. Let's say those arrows don't hit anything except for a wall. Well, there's a 30% chance that those arrows can chain off the wall to hit something else, which is pretty cool. I think that's extremely strong. So some people have probably seen the term ZHP before, but they're not really sure what it is. Basically, it stands for zero hit point build. And the reason this is done is because as you go deeper and delve all the way to 6,000 depth, you'll start to see that the monster hit points, um, as well as uh, the amount of damage that the monsters do, will dramatically increase in its scale. So after a certain depth, probably probably after 4,000 for the most part, everything is going to one-shot you. It doesn't matter how much effective hit points you have. It doesn't matter your resistances. Um, I took a little snippet on the right here. You can see that uh, at depth 4,210, and we're basing this off of a regular tier 16 monster. So that monster is going to have 4,836% more life versus a normal tier 16 monster and deal effectively 6,900% more damage. And those two numbers are going to scale all the way up to 6,000 depth. Um, and I would say most people kind of switch to this style of builds. Uh, right around between 800 to 1,000 depth. Uh, some people do it earlier. Those are usually like more experienced delvers. Uh, they tend to um, understand how delving works quite well. So they don't really have that much of an issue as far as you know switching to this build too early. Uh, people who are inexperienced at this, um, if they switch too early, they're going to end up wasting quite a bit of sulfite because at least when I switched, I switched to it at about 900 depth from a max block cyclone gladiator. And I would say probably the first 300 depths that I went down since I made the switch, um, eh, I probably wasted a good four to 500,000 sulfite just getting familiar and comfortable and learning how to play the build. 
So it's it's not one of those things where, you know, you just kind of run into it. You just pick it up when you go and you're good. You know, it takes practice and it takes time. Don't get discouraged because it's going to happen. You're going to die. Basically, your build's only running around with anywhere from 50 to 200 energy shield for the most part in that range. So, you know, if a strong fart happens to go in your direction, odds are you're going to die. So that's no good, right? And there's ways to kind of mitigate this from occurring. And the primary way is, um, I'm trying to think if Noogie said this when he was talking to Zizarin, but um, basically the best the best defense that you can have is don't get hit. That's the best defense. And that's our defense. Our goal is not to get hit. So what we do to, to, to make that occur is um, we maximize uh, ice damage as much as possible. Because that allows us to freeze monsters, and monsters that are frozen have no ability to even touch us because they can't move, right? So freezing things is pretty crucial for survivability. And movement speed is pretty big, and phasing is very big too. Uh, phasing allows you to run through monsters. So if you've ever seen uh, Deep Delver's Do Delving, uh, you'll see that a lot of the time they don't stop to kill every monster while they're doing their path. So they'll typically have a phasing flask active or phasing from another source. You could have it from something like Divergent Dash, where every time you dash, you get phasing for a couple of seconds. That's one source of it. Uh, I personally use a phasing flask, but while that phasing is active, you can literally run through monsters. So that's a pretty common theme, I would say, within Delve. And I talked about it a little bit, but, you know, we're, we're going to die. It's just part of Delving. Um, I think on my Delver right now, I have just over 12,000 deaths. Deaths, D-E-A-T-H. I've died over 12,000 times on my build. And I think I had about 5,000 on it before I switched to Delving. But a majority of those deaths are not from Delving. I, I use my uh, zero hit point build to cheese uh, Delirium app sometimes. And just grabbing Sulfite with it, you know... Um, if you're like in a park map, for example, that's, that's my personal preference uh, as far as the best sulfite gathering map uh, currently with the current atlas. Um, that map has a lot of barrels on it. And if you're right next to a barrel and your eye shot mine hits the barrel and the barrel explodes, you're going to die. So probably about half, half of the 7,000 deaths, if not more, are from barrels exploding and me dying. So, I mean, it's it's part of it. You're just going to die. There's You don't really have any defenses. I think my resistances are... My highest one is negative 54. And then I have... With my current setup, I have 122 energy shield. That's it. As chaos inoculation. So there's not very much. But, you know, there's things we can do to prevent it. And... The, the way we prevent deaths and delving is we learn from our mistakes. That's the big one. And we, you know, proper class management is huge. Uh, making sure we're leading the cart slightly while we're delving and making sure that we're going the right way while we're delving. Because if we walk in the dark, uh, it's not going to be very pretty. We die pretty rapidly. And then, of course, uh, once you get into biomes and you, you look at the biomes, some of the biomes before you get to 6,000 depth can have some rather nasty mod combinations. So in those instances, I would highly suggest just going around. You'll end up saving more sulfite. Talk about a little bit, uh, a little bit about that later. And like I said, the best way not to die is don't get hit. So. How much DPS can we do? Uh, the current build that I'm running, it's not cheap, but uh, on POB, that link right there, if you load it up, uh, for some reason or another, whenever I generate a POB, it does not allocate passive points and clusters. So that's something that needs to be done, of course. But I'm POBing at uh, 7.1 million damage per arrow from the mine. And I throw anywhere in the neighborhood of, I think it's anywhere, it's, it's like 17 to 20 mines per second, give or take, somewhere in that region. 
and there's six arrows per mine. So that kind of gives you an idea how much DPS is doing if you just do a little math that way. But it's it's almost comical because you can run into boss fights like all the conquerors. You effectively one shot them. Metamorphs, you one shot them. Uh, Kosis on the phobia and 100% delirium. Uh, they get deleted pretty quick. Uh, it's, it's kind of a meme, the amount of damage this thing does. But the reason that we have that kind of damage is because the monster life scales so insanely the deeper you go in Dale and Delve. So you, you actually need to have, you know, you need to have that kind of damage in order just to kill things. If you don't have enough damage to Delve, you're not going to be able to kill anything. So that's kind of an important thing, right? All right, so let's talk about how we get sulfate. So the Atlas is pretty cool. They they gave us you know some passive points into our atlas where we can uh, you know increase the amount of sulfite. So in this Lex Proxima region where Park Map happens to be located, um, we get uh, harvest boosts, which is pretty cool. So we can do harvest while we're farming for sulfite, uh, and then we also get a 10% chance for sulfite veins to give us double sulfite. So, like, when you run into a map and you see the little, you know, sulfite on the ground uh, with the little mine, uh, it's like mine cart uh, mini map icon, you run over to it and you click it, 10% chance just off of this that the amount that you get will be doubled. It's pretty insane. Uh, did I skip a slide? One of my slides disappeared. Okay, no, I just had them out of order. So I talked about how I got sulfite. This is still here. So method one, let's let's go to the next slide first. We'll talk about this after. So we also have washstones too. Uh, the washstones they give us uh, increased percent chance for double sulfite. Right? Um, I took that screenshot on the bottom right from Craft of Exile. Uh, the six percent uh, percent chance for double sulfite right, is extremely rare. It only has a weighting of twenty. Um, if you're alt spamming for it, I believe it's said somewhere around 9,000 alteration orbs to hit this. So it's not critical if you hit, you know, tier one of this. I have four tier two stones myself, divine to 5% chance double sulfite. And then if you look on the center of the atlas, uh, where you get the points from doing things like uh, the Maven encounters with like the Breach Lords or um, you know Cortex Boss with Uber Elder Shaper and Ziri. Uh, when you complete those, you get points from the center of your atlas. There's also a point there that's called Secrets of Stones, which gives you 25% in uh, enhanced effect of Wash Stone modifiers. So if you have a stone that has at least 4% on it, you'll get an additional percent. So my current chance for double sulfide is 34%. So pretty much every time I go into a map, um, I get anywhere from nine to 18,000 sulfide per map, which is pretty insane. And let me go back here real quick. So getting sulfide without scarabs, chisel the map, alk it, bail it, and then run your Nico mission with three sacrifice fragments. This also requires that you have excuse me, four sacrifice fragments. Requires you have a five slot atlas. So go run a four way legion encounter in your map device and then you'll unlock the fifth slot. So that's method one, chisel out veil, Nico mission, four sacrifice fragments. Method two, chisel out veil, um, use a sulfite scarab with three sac fragments. Um, the rest of sulfite scarab gives you 20% more sulfite. Palace is 40% more sulfite, Gilded is 60% more sulfite, and then Winged is 100%. Not 80, I'm pretty sure this gets right up to 100. Uh, either, either one of those four is good. Um, I personally just run Polish for the most part. Um, I've done some experimenting with Gilded and Polished. It looks like that there's not that much of a, a, a difference uh, in terms of the amount of sulfite you get between Polished and Gilded. So what I do is I chisel my map, map my map, alk it, I veil it, um, throw in a polished scarab, and then three sacrifice. And 
usually I'd say between four and six maps. I'm not topped off usually. So that's pretty good. And the way I do Scarif Sustain is um, I make a Delirium map with Scarab Rewards. And I run that map. And since we deep delve, we can fracture this map. And the more you, the deeper you get in the mines, the higher the frequency of fracture fossils uh, occurs. You'll start to see more fracture fossils. So you'll get to a point where you'll be able to sustain your self-sustaining. So you'll have fracture fossils for your own maps, and you'll still have some left over to sell. So you're basically running these maps for free, which is cool. And so this is how we make the map. We take a region that we like to farm. I like burial chambers. Uh, currently, we have some boost to uh, delirium in Lex Joris, which is where the burial chamber map is. Um, in Lex Joris, there is a 15% chance for uh, delirium maps to spawn with three additional reward boxes. So if you look at the like the left side, the bottom left of your screen, when you go into Delirium Map, you'll have the one random reward and then five rewards based on the five orbs you pick. So in our case, it'll be five scarabs. But if that 15% chance procs, you'll have three more boxes. So there'll be nine Delirium rewards that you'll have access to. One of them, I don't know why they did this, but the... For some reason, the devs of this game did not decide to shift it over to the right a little bit. One of the orbs is hidden uh, behind the box, or behind the life, your life orb. So, how we make the map, we pick the region we like to farm. I picked uh, Ejoris because I like burial chambers. Um, our map device, as of right now, does not have Nemesis on it. We can have access to it through either Infused Nemesis or we can Fracture Nemesis onto it. So we'll be running Harvests to find a Big Mama Bear that gives us the Fracture. So we are going to do a Fracture 3 prefixes, with one of those prefixes being Nemesis. Or we're going to Fracture 5, so the map needs 5 affixes and one of those will be Nemesis. Um, if we hit the Nemesis, uh, we're going to enchant the map with does not consume sections. Then we're going to apply our scootering orbs. Um, then you can use the map, uh, I think it's Hillock and Intervention, I believe, to give us 35% quality on the map. Uh, and then we're going to fracture the map with the fracture fossil. So when you fracture this map, be cognizant of what the map looks like. You want to make sure that you see the original map as it is, and you want to make sure you see the mirrored map as it is. Because if you accidentally put your original map in the map device and run it, that map's gone forever. So you won't be able to fracture it. So make sure that your map says mirrored on it before you put it in the map device. Uh, I made that mistake one time. It cost me about 300 exalts. I was sad. So I won't be making that mistake again. And I don't want any of you guys to make that mistake either. Um, sextants I like to run. Uh, these are just awakened sextants. Of course, we have elevated sextants now, so you can even you know juice it further. But uh, for awakened sextants, I run uh, Nemesis Currency. I run a Unique Corrupted uh, to get more six links. I run Hunted Traders uh, for additional monsters on the map. Then I do uh, additional Beyond Chance. So those four, those four are pretty good. Um, you're going to be picking Beyond on your map device, and you're also going to pick Alva because, of course, Beyond, the more monsters we kill within a certain area, the more Beyond monsters we spawn. And then Alva adds, in a bugged pack size map, Alva, three Alvas probably adds close to a 1,000 additional monsters onto the map. I'd have to estimate if not more so, somewhere in that region. It's a lot. A lot more monsters for a lot more rewards. And then my scarab preference of choice, I like uh, Gilded or Winged Breach, uh, Rusted Elder, Gilded or Winged Harpy, or Gilded or Winged Bush. Um, you can also do Legion if your build is 
you know, capable of clearing lesions and 100% delirium uh, before the timer expires, then I'd probably consider uh, swapping out the ambush for a legion. Um, and also, if your map already has Elder or Shaper on it, then go ahead and just use uh, Legion instead of the rest of Elder Scarab. And let's talk about our biomes a little bit. I'm going to go to this page first, and I'll go back. So this page just talks about, um, you know, what we expect to look at or see when we look at our Delve chart. Uh, we can see to our top left side, there's a purple area. This is called Fungal Caverns. Uh, beneath that, it's kind of like a tannish orange color. That's the uh, sulfur vents. That area is great because that's where the fracture fossil is located within that biome. Uh, to the right of that, there is the petrified forest biome. Uh, that special fossil is the bloodstained fossil. That one's pretty good, too. Uh, that little blue uh, two-unit square to, just to the right of that, that is the uh, the frozen hollow biome. That contains the time-loss cavern node, which gives a glyphic fossil. It, then that node can be impossible in some situations, depending on what essence monsters spawn. Um, I'd recommend you know going around it, unless you know for sure that it's something you can do. You can go check it once, but if you get a, like an a essence combination where there's woe and envy present together, just skip it. It's not even worth wasting sulfite. Uh, to the right of that small blue patch down towards the bottom, see some green area. That's the abyssal depths. That's not a bad biome to run through. And then we, in the top center of our page, we have uh, the red area, which is the magma fissure. And then not located on this chart, we have uh, Primeval Ruins. That's where all the Delve Boss all is. We have Veil Outpost. That's where the Blind Guy is. We have the Abyssal City, which is the Lich King boss. Let's go back and talk about some of this a little bit. Sulfur Vents, in my opinion, is probably one of the easiest biomes to run through. Um, there's, to, to this point, um, as far as generation of the path, how the path is generated, um, to my knowledge and to the knowledge of a few other people I've talked to about this, um, there's no predictable generation for this biome. So we don't really know exactly where the cart is going to be going, but it's not difficult to tell in this biome. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, the frozen hollow biome. It's not that bad to run through, but there's not really any identifying landmarks that indicate which direction the cart's going to turn. So this one is kind of done on feel. And the way I can describe this one, as far as pathing is concerned, let's look at like in the top right region. Um, well, you know what? This is probably not the best example. Maybe I'll pull up a delve chart after this and try to explain how I do those. How I path through it, but there's not really a, a good um, a good way to explain how to uh, path through that node accurately each time. Um, basically, you, you just learn it through uh, doing it a number of times, and then looking at, of course, looking at the Delve chart first, because if you look at the path from node to node, that kind of gives you an idea of what the path's going to do a little bit, like the overall direction of the path. And that can kind of slightly indicate to you, um, you know, which way you need to run as you're going. And, you know, your objective is to be slightly in front of the cart. You don't want to be too far. Well, obviously, it's almost impossible to get too far in front of it. You can if you, like, accidentally shortcut a corner. Sometimes the cart will stay behind, and then you just die because you're in the darkness. But you do not want the cart to lead you. You want to lead them. Uh, the Magma Fisher Biome. Pretty easy to path through. Um, doesn't really have any ugly monsters. Monsters don't really do. I say the worst monsters in there are probably the cave stalkers, which they scream at you from like off screen and you just die. They touch you. Everything does at this point. And then the bats, if like the bats that fly and they they 
do like this like sonic pulse in your direction. Um, you don't want them to do that. If they hit you with that, you're dead, of course. And keep going. Fungal Caverns. This one can be absolutely brutal if you don't have gas inoculation on, which is probably true in a lot of instances if you're not below like 600 depth. You might not have chaos inoculation on yet. But if you kill any of the zombies that are there, they drop chaos degen on the ground. And um, I'd say like after like 700 depth, you'll pretty much just get instant deleted by that chaos degen unless you're either CI or you have max chaos res. And then even with max chaos res, once you get to like 1200, you just get deleted. And probably one of the trickiest ones to go through is the Petrified Force. Um, there's probably like three or four different type of landmarks that you want to look out for in that biome for pathing. And they can be kind of hard to spot. So it's it's not one of those things where you can, you know, almost stop in the middle of the node and like look for the landmark. You have to kind of look at all this stuff as you're running. And pick it up on the fly and make your adjustments at, like immediately as soon as you see it. And the mini biomes, the Abyssal City has the Lich Boss. Stay away from this one. Don't even go through it. There's Abyssal Monsters that flicker strike on top of you and you just die. And sometimes you die and it looks like nothing even hits you. So that biome is just complete trash. I would highly recommend avoiding it. It's not worth it. Uh, the Primeval Ruins, that one's pretty easy to run through. Only thing you got to watch out for there is the Floating Orb guys that they spawn in the Azerite nodes. Uh, be careful of those. Those are not fun. You, you, when you kill them, they'll start to fire like ice projectiles everywhere. Best way to deal with that, put up a frost wall right underneath. Him. And when he dies, the projectiles will just hit the frost wall and they won't be able to reach you. Uh, the Veil Outpost, also not too bad to run through, but watch out for the Veil Constructs. Uh, I don't know if it's a bug or not, but for whatever reason, this is totally true in my situation and some other people I've talked to as well that do delving, but a lot of times those Veil Constructs will kill you before their attack animation occurs. So be careful for those. Those ones are kind of scary. Show this one already. Talk about node mods a little bit made a list of two if you have a combination of two or more of these um be careful do what you can to probably go around it odds are you're going to be doing a little bit of dying in there if you do decide to go through it but you got a mod called uh monsters action speed cannot be slowed below base value this one is my least favorite mod um with this one you can still apply the freeze effect but the monster itself is never frozen nor its action speed is decreased either. So when you chill a monster, the monster's action speed is decreased. When you freeze a monster, the action speed is decreased to zero. But with this mod on there, they just keep moving at you normally. So unless you can one-shot everything in there, like everything, it's probably not that great to go through. Uh, Nemesis is absolutely terrible in Delve. Um... The good thing about Ice Shot Mines, though, is if we run across Proximity Shield monsters, we can throw our mines into the Proximity Shield and the monster will die. So that's kind of cool. Um, if we have Onslaught combined with the 30% increased attack move speed, this is 30% or higher, I think it was at 35%. But Onslaught is 20% increase, and then you get the 30 plus percent, so you can be looking at up to 55% increased attack and move speed and gas speed. That's kind of scary. Uh, a couple honorable mentions to look out for. Your tank mods, so things like elemental resistances, uh, reduced damage for fist strikes, and more life. If you have all three of those on a node, with any one of the above, don't even go through it. You're just totally wasting your time, because it's going to take you a long time to kill the monsters, um, as well as your chance for dying is going to dramatically increase. And Bloodlines is not fun either because you have uh, Order of the Frozen Sky where they do like a blizzard rain on your forehead and you're just dead. So Bloodlines is pretty annoying. But 
Uh, I think I said this earlier, once you get past 6,000 depth, you don't have to deal with any more mods because there's no more mods in the biomes. So let's keep going. And I'll talk about my bow. So I mirrored this bow from a guy I met in the Discord server. I'll, I'll put up a link for that server uh, towards the end of this presentation. Uh, my build is, is a dexterity stacking variant. There's two variants of this build primarily. There's the fizz base variant. Uh, pretty damn expensive to get all the gear for that. Uh, but the amount of damage you do is absurd. Um, I'm PO being at like 7.1 million right now. But if you decide to go the fizz route and your gear is all mirror tier, you can hit between 40 and 60 million damage per arrow. Which, in my opinion, is kind of overkill. It's not really necessary. Uh, doesn't I mean of course you delete things everything is pretty much a one shot when you have damage like that but it's not really necessary it can help a little bit if you do like to do del bossing but I'm I'm just down there to get fossils primarily so I don't worry about it too much. But in our bow what's great we got you know tier one flat cold uh we got our hybrid elder crit mod where it gives us percent increased crit chance with 50% crit multiplier if we haven't dealt a critical strike recently. I talked about this previously. Talk about it again real quick. We throw mines. And we don't attack. Our mines do the attacking. So we never deal a critical strike. Our mines deal the critical strikes. So with that mod on there, we always have 50% increased critical strike multiplier. Pretty good. Of course, we have our cold damage per dexterity. Uh, we have an essence crafted uh, cold resistance penetration. We have plus three arrows. So instead of firing three arrows, we have the one arrow from the skill itself, the two arrows from Dead Eye Ascendancy, and then we have three arrows additional on the bow. So we shoot six arrows from each mine. So the bow's pretty good. I like the bow. I've had quite a bit of fun with this since I've been using it. Uh, amulet. One on the top right uh, is the one I currently use. Uh, the ver version currently existing uh, has 50% increased elemental damage attacks instead of 36. It's happened to work out that the guy I mirrored the bow from, was he had this amulet, and he's wanted to upgrade to the new one. So I'm like, bro, I'll buy that one off you. Give me a deal. And it happened, so that's what happened. I got the amulet. I was happy. With that amulet, we got sent implicits of damage per dex, uh, increased dex. Uh, we got over 100 flat decks on the amulet. We got cold damage to attacks, crit multi, uh, crafted on the bench with pro speed damage. And we got elements of damage with attack skills. So, And then, of course, uh, Savagery, the Anoint, is an extra frenzy charge. Uh, pretty good because Charged Mines, one of the skills in our gem links for eye shot, uh, each frenzy charge that we have is 10% increased additional mine throwing speed. So that's pretty good. Um, the amulet on the on the bottom is something that you're probably going to be able to craft in the league. Although I'm not sure if you can craft something like this uh, with the, you know, the state that harvest will be in or what we expect it to be in. You should be able to make something sort of like this, I would say, without harvest crafting. But it's going to be really hard. It's not going to be that easy. You might be able to hit like, you know, three or four out of the six mods. But getting all six of those mods together is going to be quite difficult. Uh, here's the helmet I use. Um, this is an old Legacy Blast Chain Mine mod, where it gives us Blast Chain Mine with Throw Additional Mine. Um, I think this is pretty cool because uh, we get we always have an additional mine. Uh, we're not relying on having you know 800 dexterity for curtain call. I happen to have more than that. But uh, this helmet happens to be better than Curtain Call. So that's why I'm using it. I also, you know, show a Curtain Call next because this is what you can expect to get if you're in a league. This is probably the best in slide helmet. Um, that old Shaper mod does not exist anymore for the uh, throw additional mine. So as long as we have 800 dexterity with Curtain Call on, we'll be throwing an extra mine. So that's, that's a good thing. Um, we are looking for a Berserk buff effect or reduce raise loss uh, enchants for our helmet, for our lab enchant. So either one of those I think is pretty good. 
Uh, what belt are we using? Uh, we're using this Wraith locket on the top right right now. We got percent increase attributes, uh, percent increase call damage, boost speed during flask effect, uh, damage with hits against shield enemies, heavy damage with attacks, and increased mine throwing speed. Which and we have an abyssal socket. So this belt to me uh, is massive quality of life. Uh, we do quite a bit more damage. We're able to move faster. We have an abyssal socket. Uh, that's pretty good. Um, there's not really anything better in slot, I would say. Um, uh, as far as budget options concerned, Cyclopean Coil can do the job. Uh, you will get 18% increase attributes on a perfectly rolled one that has been uh, catalyzed with uh, Metamorph Catalysts. And then uh, String of Servitude is pretty good too. That's, I was using that for a long time before I got this belt on the top right. But you wanted to have increased dex and crit multi during flask effect. Those two together are really strong. Uh, body armor, you got a high reach chest. Looking for uh, you know dexterity for quality. And I should have a legacy one because I'm the standard, but I don't. Yep, let me go back. In fact, I should just go buy one because they're like three or four exalts. Not that cheap. They're probably like between seven and ten exalts. They're not very expensive. So I should buy one. Um, if you got a lot of currency sitting around or you like to spam uh, Alba Temples for those corruption chambers, you're looking for uh, a plus four chest, basically. And those are pretty expensive. Also, I would. For the dex, dex, uh, dexterity stacking version, don't even consider using an influenced armor because high reads is just better. If you're doing fizz base though, you can probably use uh, an influenced armor. Uh, our quiver, uh, I use a point blank high reads. Um, I would say a chain one is pro or projectiles chain one additional time is probably slightly better. In fact, it is better. Um, the best in existence has both point blank and chain. Last I checked, there was one on PoE trade. Um, the guy who has it has not been online in like half a year or something. And I'm sure, like, the second he logs in, it'll get spammed by people for this clover because point blank with chain is insane together. But this, this help, or excuse me, this, uh, this quiver is huge for uh, for deck stacking and damage because we get attributes. Excuse me, yeah, we get 30 all attributes, so flat decks, and then we get uh, deck stack cold damage. That's extremely strong. And then point blank is great too because um, we can throw mines. Uh, the way point blank works with mines is uh, the location that your mines are, uh, where you throw them in proximity. Or with respect to the enemy's location, the closer you throw the mine to the enemy, um, that's going to give you more damage based on point blank. So it, it's kind of the same as far as self shots concerned. Like it, you know, if you're playing like a magic find a tornado shot build or something, if you have point blank, you run right up next to the, whatever your target is and start shooting it. You're gonna do thirty percent more damage. So that also works for our mines. So high reads is really good here. Um, Fizz builds, I use a different quiver. Uh, boots, um, a long, long, long time I used bubonic trails with two abyssal sockets. They're not bad boots by any means. Um, in fact, I might even consider going back to them only in the event that I get a uh, plus one chain quiver. But currently I'm using uh, replica void walkers because uh, as long as we're phasing, our projectiles chain an additional time. Important note. Uh, if we read the mod on the boot, it says you have phasing if you killed recently. Since we throw mines, we never kill. So you will never get phasing directly from these boots. You have to uh, use a, a, a quartz flask, a phasing flask. You'll just never get it uh, procced from the boots since we're throwing mines, like I said. But both of these are good choices. I'm using the Void Walkers right now. I like them better at this point. But like I said, if I ever end up getting the plus one chain, a uh, high recover, I might go back to bubonics, but we'll see. Uh, rings. 
that glyph turn ring was created. Uh, the original creator of that ring finished it like probably four or five days ago. And I mirrored it because that thing is nasty. We got plus one frenzy charge, contributes to overall damage in my throwing speed. Big flat decks, she's cold damage, flat cold two attacks, crit multi, LE damage attack skills, and then uh, benchcraft to decrease damage. This ring took my. Uh, previously, I was using a circle of fear uh, with uh, hatred boosts, but I put this ring on and. This ring alone made my tooltip, or not my tooltip, my POB number go up almost 2 million damage per arrow. So this ring is nuts. Try to get a ring like this if you can. Um, hmm. I'm not sure how viable it's going to be to try to craft one of these uh, with the Harvest Nerf, although it should be possible because it's a synthesized item. It's not a an influenced item. So I th I think we should be able to use all of our augments on it still. It's just that if we miss, um, you know, we're gonna have to you know close our eyes and annulment a little bit and just hope for the best. But getting all you know five mods on there is gonna be pretty hard, I think. So something like that, a ring like this, even though if it's not you know all T1 mods, that'll be just fine. Uh, my second ring, uh, believe it or not, it's kind of trash. In fact, it is trash. I got it on this build because I just had it sitting around and I ran out of currency. Otherwise, I would have mirrored that ring up there on top twice. Two of those would be really insane, but I got to go farm up another mirror worth of currency so I can. But uh, for the time being, I got that second ring. And let's keep going. Some examples of some other rings. Uh, that smaller picture on the right. That's a lot more realistic uh, of what you can expect to get, um, at least while Harvest is still, you know, a thing for us. Uh, let's look at our gloves real quick. These gloves are Warlord influence. A lot of people are like, well, why aren't they Warlord with Hunter? And the reason for that is, um, well, you know, of course, the Hunter mod for the gloves can give you percent increase dexterity, or is it percent increase attribute? It's one of the two. Uh, the reason I didn't go that route is because uh, we get the plus one frenzy charge from Hunter. We get calling strike from Hunter. Um, I think the flat dex is, ends up being more dexterity versus the percent dex. So that's why I like to go this direction. We got the missile socket. And then we also got the uh, benchcraft damage during classic effect. So, uh, you know, some of you guys who are not really familiar with ZHP, at this point, you know, you can kind of start to see in my build that. There's nothing here for defenses. And the reason for that, I explained earlier, was, you know, the monsters all here are going to one-shot us anyway. So there's no point in having defense. Just go pure damage. Anything that contributes to your damage, just do it. Uh, jewels are tricky. Let's talk about them. So, Lethal Pride. Um... What Lethal Pride does for us is it allows us to get a passive point uh, for the skill Chain Breaker, which allows us to generate rage. And our rage is gen uh, the rage generation is determined uh, by the amount of mana regen you have. So the more mana regen you have, the faster it regens, and the slower it diminishes. So the reason we use uh, or regenerate rage, so we can use Berserk. Because when Berserk is active, we have quite a bit more damage and quite a bit more move speed. Two things that are just great for Delvin. Uh, I've included a list of some of the seeds, seed numbers that we that we know of. Uh, there's probably more in existence. Uh, I think all of these should be at least 10% double damage. But uh, that number 15981, that gives you 15%. Increased double damage uh, based on our, our skill tree and where we put the jewel to. So if you ever played an aura stacker, if you look at the area that is um, right above the ranger start, where the charisma wheel is, the aura wheel, um, slightly above that to the left, there's a jewel socket. That's where you're going to be putting your lethal track right there. It's just under the shadow start as well. 
Uh, cluster jewels. Basically, we're looking for four, at least four medium. The four of these in the build. Some people put six. I got four in mine. We're looking for guerrilla tactics and surprise sabotage. Um, guerrilla tactics is nuts. You get increased chaff and mine damage, increased chaff and mine throwing speed, and move speed. And surprise sabotage is really nuts too because we get 5% pin and crit multi for our trap. So those two are like the big ones. Um, if we can get uh, plus dexterity or plus all attributes on them, that's even better too. Get those for your small passes. Those are good. Our large cluster jewel. Uh, right now I only got one of these. I got to finish uh, making another one. But we're looking for vengeful commander and blanket of snow together. And then the third mod on those is just a filler. It can be literally any roll. Um, we're not going to be allocating our points into that because if you look at like the cluster wheel, there's the jewel socket where you put it on the tree. Then there's one point, and then you have um, I think there's two other small passes. Then you have the two. So you got blanket of snow and uh, vengeful commander. Or no, excuse me. It's the one point, and then there's Mike Snow, Vengeful Commander. And then you got your Jewel Sockets. So, Blanket of Snow gives us 10% pan against chilled enemies. Insane damage boost. Really good. And Vengeful Commander gives us hatred, increased uh, effect for hatred, which is big. And then we'll have our room for our medium clusters. These are gold clusters, I mean, too. Uh, Watcher's Eye. The zealotry part of this one, whatever, you don't need it. Uh, look for cold pin with hatred and 15% um, chance to recover 10% of mana when you use the skill when clarity is active. This allows us to not require the use of the mana flask because mines don't cost a whole lot of mana to begin with, but you will run out because your region, that the mana region that you do have, is applied to rage regeneration and not your actual mana region. So you will run out of mana. But mines usually cost between four and seven mana each time you throw one. So throwing it and detonating it are two acts, two separate acts. And our mine throwing speed is so high that, and our detonation speed is quite high too, that our mana will essentially just always fill up. We might run out from time to time, but it'll almost always fill right back up. As long as we have that clarity in Watcher's Eye. So that's pretty big. Um, if you can only find one of these mods, get the clarity one. Uh, the hatred one is, is pretty big, but get the clarity one. That one's more important. Our Abyssal Jewels. Um, these ones are great. We got Crit Multi. Flat ES is nice because we got an extra split second that we can be in the dark without dying. Uh, otherwise, if you just walk in the dark, you're gone. We got flat cold damage, and then we got damage pin if we have a kill recently. And I explained earlier, our minds do all the killing. We don't. We never kill. So this one's always active. Pretty strong. And then we have, uh, I call these the triple crit multi jewel. So you'll have uh, crit multi itself straight up. Crit multi with cold skills. I shot the cold skill, so it'll get crit multi. Then crit strike multi with uh, Ellie skills. Uh, I shot cold skill, which is now so you'll have three instances of crit multiplier, additional crit multiplier. Then your fourth mod will be uh, mind throwing. Really strong jewels. Uh, I actually don't have any in mine right now. I want to get some. Uh, a buddy of mine has one that I love to mirror a couple times. Um, he is a synthesized one with the implicit of flat decks and additional mind throwing speed, which is nuts. So once more mirrors come, I'll get some of those. Gem setup. Um, this is if you're running ice shot in your weapon and barraging like your chests. You can do ice shot, high impact mine, charge mines, elemental damage attacks. If you can do it, awaken damage off of life, trap mine damage. Um, I will say this, Blast Chain Mine does not work very well with attack skills. It's much better for spells, so don't even consider it here. High Impact Mine is significantly stronger. 
that brass set up is effectively the same thing. We're just swapping the brass, brass shot. And our helmet, if we're not using Hero Device, we're using Divergent Summon Skitter Bots and Divergent Bone Shield. If we are using Hero Device, we're just doing regular Summon Skitter Bots and Hero Device. There's not going to be any Bone Shield. Uh, let's see, we got Veil Summon Skeletons, Clarity, Dash, Second Wind. Uh, you'll be using skeletons quite a bit in Dell. Uh, skeletons. The biggest reason you use skeletons in Dells is they aggravate monsters. So you can cast your skeletons away from you, and if there's monsters that are like extremely far away that you can't really hit too well, your skeleton they'll see your skeletons and they'll run over to your skeletons. So you'll be able to hit them uh, significantly easier. That's pretty cool. Then our boots we got you know Frostwall Spell Cascade. Increased duration and berserk. Uh, this was the setup I used to run. Setup I currently run. I only use ice shot now. I don't use barrage anymore. So my weapon. Uh, I'm actually running divergent dash, which gives me. Uh, excuse me. I'm using anomalous dash on this build, so I have three dashes. Or no, excuse me. It is anomalous, but I'm also using anomalous second one, so that gives me three dashes instead of two. But Anomalous Dash increases your dash distance by an additional 20%. So that's just quality of life. Uh, we got Bell Summon Skeletons. Uh, here's the big three. You get level 4 Enhance, uh, Berserk, and Detonate Mines. Those three together. Uh, Berserk gains attack damage based on quality. And Detonate Mines with quality increases your detonation speed. So having level 4 Enhance on both of those, huge boost to your build. Highly recommend doing it. Um, finding landmarks in Delve. Um, this is basically for pathing, how you run around. I'm going to just move ahead to the next slides and talk about it. I just a little bit of circling on things here. So, like if you're running through the Funkle Caverns, um, the location at the very right, towards the bottom, bottom right corner with the little yellow circle, that's where we start this node. And then, like the middle of the image to the left, with the little small yellow circle, that's where we end the node. And the yellow circles that I placed throughout this image, uh, I call those choke points. If we ever see those while we're running through this biome, we just run straight through them. So keep your eye out for that. That's probably like the biggest one you'll see here. Um, there's a there's two other ones, but they weren't on this chart. Um, I have a YouTube playlist that has uh, different nodes that I'm doing. Um, I believe some of those will have uh, the other landmarks present, so you can just check those out. But look for these choke points when you're running through the Bungle Cavern. They're really big. They'll help you a lot. Um, sulfur Vents. This one's like straightforward. It's super straightforward. Um, you're never like really running through any like choke point type things. Uh, the path is Almost always, it's just intuitive as far as where it's going. You should be able to find out where it's going pretty easy. So uh, again, in this image, we're starting at the bottom right, and we're finishing at the top left. And we only have turns for the most part here. And the turn is either indicated by nothing, or it's indicated by the small circles I put there. And those circles, if the if you'll see like a column. If it's on the left side, it's a left turn. It's on the right side of the path. It's a right turn. That's pretty much it. Uh, the Magma Fisher biome. Uh, this one, um, there's a lot of straight throughs. So you'll come upon a region where there's the path will split into two or it'll split into three. And if you see that, nine times out of ten, you're running straight through it. Um, generally speaking, the turns here are mostly off of just a straight up turn. There's not really any other splits. It's rare, but they show up. So just look for like the straight throughs. There's one more type of straight through pass on here in the delve itself, but it's not located on this chart. And then here's the hard one. This is probably the hardest one to get through, I'd say. Um, in the Petrified Forest, there's like a whole lot of different uh, possible turns and straight throughs here. But. I would say the best way to get through this node 
or pathing here is just do it a whole lot of times. You'll start to like be, become comfortable with and identify like, okay, the car's getting ready to do this. Let me keep running here. And you know, from time to time, you'll still make mistakes. But I mean, I I still I still make mistakes in the uh, petrified boards. Uh, biome sometimes too. It's it's not easy. It's tricky. So uh, this one, the orange circles, they indicate a straight through. The yellow circles also indicate a straight through. Uh, the lone pillar in this biome will be located opposite the direction you're going to turn. So the green circle, we see the pillar on the left side. We're going to make a right turn. Um, that kind of grayish circle we see with uh, at the left side, we see that the column is on the right side, so we're going to make a left turn. And then you have, uh, towards the bottom center of the image, there's that gray circle with those two columns circled. But we also have a protrusion that's coming out from the uh, dead south of that area. It's like three things that are circled there. That's another left turn example. Um, and then the, the orange ones you can see, those are tricky. Those are really hard to spot, but those are those are just straight throughs. And like I said, you know, just practice this biome a lot. You'll, you'll pick it up. It'll come. We got the Abyssal Death. This one's pretty easy. Uh, you'll see like a protrusion that kind of, you know, goes sort of in the opposite direction of the direction that you're running from. And depending on what side of, you know, the biome, or excuse me, the path it's on, that's going to indicate to you which way it turns. You kind of look for like that little, it almost looks like a like a, an eagle's uh, foot or something. Basically, the direction that you see the hook is the direction you turn. So like, if you see a hook that, you know, I don't know if I can do it on camera. It's kind of hard to explain. Let's just take a look at this picture here. So that red circle one I have, we have a hook that kind of goes to the left a little, right? Like if you look at the bottom of the hook, it points left. So we're going to make a left turn. And then we look at the green circle. We got a hook. makes It points to the right. We're going to make a right turn. And then we got a straight through here in the yellow circle. And now there's one other one but it's not present. Or excuse me, there's two other ones. There's one other straight through example, not located on this picture. Then there's one other example of left and right turns, not located on this picture. Should be in the videos though. I have. Uh, camping locations for each node. Uh, these might be hard to see. Let me know if they're hard to see. Um, try to squeeze a bunch of screenshots onto uh, you know, a PowerPoint slide. Um, I don't have every single node screenshotted for this because I made some videos about different nodes. So take a look at those videos as well. They'll be helpful. I'm just going to quickly go through these. Um, we can, you know, look at the picture. There's like a very small X on the, the image. And then there's the circle with the cart node on the mini map. The cart, the, excuse me, the cart icon. That's like where the cart is present when it reaches the node. The X is where I stand. I stand there and I throw a flare. That's pretty much it for all these. I'll just go through these real quick. Put a few videos up. Um, I think I have the playlist on this PowerPoint. If not, I'll put it on really quick. Or I'll put the playlist in the uh, description for the PowerPoint. I'll do that, okay? That'll be easier. Uh, here's the Discord I was talking about at the very beginning of the video. Uh, Moss Heidi Hole. Uh, basically just join it, ask questions. People that are in there, they all been dealing for a long time. They know how things work. And, I mean, we're always trying to figure out how to do this better. So new new ways to do things will always come up. And recently they added a section for crafting, so we kind of talk about crafting a little bit too. But that's probably going to change a little bit with Harvest, so we'll see. There it is, video tutorials on nodes. That is the playlist, so check that out. Because that will have, um, you know, quite a bit of data on um, how I do the nodes. Uh, keep in mind, it might differ a little bit because uh, in these nodes, I'm below 6,000 depth already. 
So I'm not dealing with stuff like Nemesis and can't be frozen and all that. All the nodes don't have mods. So in some instances, I can be like a little bit more free with where I'm located. But I think it should be like, you know, for the most part, a pretty good guide on how to do things. Um, you know, obviously there's things I missed. Delving is such a huge, comprehensive, and broad topic that it's almost impossible to cover everything. So, you know, I try to just hit the, hit the high points and get as much as I out, you know, out to you guys as I could. But um, that's pretty much the presentation. Uh, hopefully things go well. I apologize. My camera was doing some crazy shit in the middle of this presentation. It's kind of irritating. I'm probably going to have to get a new one. But uh, thanks for watching, guys. Um, I'm streaming on Twitch. I'll leave a link to that in the description as well. Come say hi. Whatever. You know, enjoy yourselves. All right, guys. Thank you.